Welcome. Uh, my name is Chuck Rose. Um, this panel event is called Think Like a Criminal. I mean, <laughs> sorry, I, I got it that wrong. I knew I was going to screw that. Think like a producer. But I think you'll find that both, uh, both ways uh, may get you to where you want to go. But we'll, we'll, we'll stick with the legal stuff here. Uh, we have an esteemed panel here tonight, uh, and I will briefly introduce them. They have massive credits, but I'll just try to hit a few of the highlights. Um, sitting right next to me, um, uh, we, at, we have two husband-wife teams who work together a lot and also work together apart. So the first team, not husband and wife? Husband You're husband and wife? Not yet. <laughs> You're not husband and wife? I just have to call him my actual husband, but we'll, we'll sort that out later. Well, for, just for today, make Tonight, believe. Okay. Um, let's start here, and then as I'll screw up as I get down the line here. Um, uh, these two folks here, I don't know what the relationship is, but the, the first one is an actor, writer, producer, among her acting credits, All My Children, One Life to Live, Beyond Life, and The Meat. Uh, she works with her husband and with their company, Morning Dove Films. Uh, he is an actor, producer, among his acting credits, Dear Harvard, Desiderata, and Awake. Uh, they recently together completed their first feature film called White Alligator. Please welcome Viviana Leo and Stuart Luth. <laughs> and now to get really complicated, these two who aren't married, but it would be a lot easier if they were, they work together. Um, Kate is, a, is an actor, writer, director, producer. Among her stage credits, Legally Blonde, the musical, Ordinary Days, the other Josh Cohn, for which she was nominated for the Drama Desk Award. She is co-creator, writer, uh, and director for a terrific web series, Submissions Only. How many people here have seen Submissions Only? Okay, if you haven't, go to submissionsonly.com tomorrow because it's, it, it's really funny and it's very well done. It's a, they really did a terrific job with that. And uh, the co-creator with her on this, uh, who's also uh, writer, director, cinematographer, and editor, and not husband, uh, his acting credits include Mary Poppins, Susical, Beauty and the Beast, uh, and Newsies, for which he was nominated for the Outer Critics Circle Award, uh, Andrew Keenan Bolger, and Kate Weatherhead, in reverse. <laughs> And um, a very talented producer there on the end. She has a multitude of producing credits across a wide range of budgets in both documentary and narrative filmmaking. Her documentaries include And Everything Is Going Fine, Let's Talk About Sex, great title, Love Marilyn, Shepherd in Dark, which is opening October 11th, uh, distributed by Music Box Films. Uh, you can find it in the theater in New York City very soon. IFC. IFC. Uh, among her narrative uh, credits, Nadja, Sunday, Hamlet, uh, written by a great screenwriter who, if you can get him, you will have it made. But unfortunately, William Shakespeare is his name. I don't know if he's still alive. Um, and uh, Secretary, uh, 13 Conversations About One Thing, and a film called Lucky Them, which just premiered at Toronto. She just came back from Toronto. It was reviewed in Variety today. Got a great review. Check it out. Please welcome Amy Hobby. <laughs> and a very... Uh, wonderful and multi-talented artist. He is an actor, writer, director, producer among his acting credits. Spider-Man, Suburbia, The Station Agent, those are his sibilant credits. Uh, he is a co-director and producer of the documentary Altered by Elvis. Uh, he wrote and starred in The Cake Eaters, a wonderful film which he brought to my little film festival, Art House Film Festival, a few years ago. Uh, directed by Mary Stewart Masterson, which starred Kristen Stewart, who was absolutely unknown then and became a big star. So if you want to be discovered by somebody, this is the guy, Jace Bartok. Okay, before we get rolling with this great panel here, I want to get a little bit of an idea, um, just a very general idea about where all of you are coming from. So I'm just going to ask you a few questions, and by a show of hands, um, Answer them. Uh, let's see. Um, how many people here uh, want to do a web series? Raise your hand. Okay. I'd say 10 or 15 or 20. Okay, that's a lot. Um, now, how many people here uh, want to do a TV show? Not quite as many. And uh, how many people here want to do a feature film? Raise your hands. Oh, a lot. Like, Two-thirds of the joint, wow. That's a lot of movies. And um, 
Okay, now, how many people here have a screenplay they want to produce? Raise your hands. Okay, just about as many. How many people have a screenplay that they think is ready to go? It's done. Raise your hand. It's really ready to go. Okay, half as many. Okay. Um, now, how many people here have a budget over $1 million? Raise your hands. <laughs> One. Okay. That's all right. Well, no, but so... so Nobody has a tent pole at 150 million, probably, I'm guessing. Okay. How many people, uh, 500,000 to $1 million budget? One. All right, good. How many people, uh, 200,000 to 500,000? About five. Okay. How many people under 200,000? Okay, everybody else. How many people under 100,000? Oh, nobody. Oh, couple, okay, I'm sorry, it's hard with the lights to see everybody. How many under 50,000? Nobody. Really? Hmm. This is going to be challenging. Um, well, actually, it'll be easier, because you have a lot more experience spending money than not spending money. Um, okay, now, I'm going to ask uh, two questions, and then we'll get rolling. Um, raise your hand uh, if you know the answer to this question. Define producing in two words or less. Anyone want to take a crack? Right there. Sorry? I couldn't hear that. Problem solving? Wow. Give her her money back. She won. That's it. <laughs> Problem solving. That's it. Absolutely. Write that down. That's what producing is. Problem solving. And I'll give you a hint. This one's four words. This is your last question. How do you become a producer? Raise your hand. Wow, this one must be a tough one. No, no hands? Okay, I'll tell you one hand. Okay, go ahead. You do it? Pretty close, pretty close. But that's three words. It's four words. You say, I am a producer. That's how you become a producer. It's actually very easy. Much easier than becoming a director or an editor or a cinematographer or an actor. You just say, I am a producer. Okay? Now, if you only leave here with those two things, you will have gotten half of the education you get at USC or NYU. Now we move to our panel. The questions get harder. Um, first, a very general question. We'll get into the whys and hows and whats. By the way, we can't do this in two hours, but we're going to try. It really, this really takes a couple of years, but we're going to try to do it in, in, in two hours. Um, why are you a producer? We'll start here and work our way down. What do you think? You two guys. You must know why you're a producer. I mean, it, it, is this on? I think so. <laughs> it was really, you guys can hear me. Okay. Um, it was really a just a <laughs> means to an end. I wanted to make a movie. <laughs> so, and I had been actually reading about producing through like books at the library, you know, just really grassroots. Um, and finally I just woke up one day and I'm like, you know, no time like the present. Uh, I have this, the, f the script was finally done. It, it got to that point where I wrote it um, and got to that point where I was like, I'm gonna throw up if I did one more revision. So I was like, I guess that's good, you know, and it's, it's good to go. And um, took it by the rest of my team. They, they thought it was fine and, and we proceeded. So you needed a producer, so you hired yourself? Yeah, it's funny that I mentioned my team because it was actually just me at the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I guess like the team in my head, but, um, <laughs> but it, I, I actually created a team by, by kickstarting it and I, and I did do the fundraising on Kickstarter. So, through that, that's actually how I brought in my husband, because he, he was a killer fundraiser, and then a bunch of other people. Um, but yeah, you could talk about that a bit. <laughs> sure, yeah, I mean, I had no intention of, of becoming a producer. This was gonna be Viviana's project, but um, in, in raising money and finding that I was raising money, I said, okay, I guess I'm, I'm becoming a producer. But then, really, in hindsight, I'm, I'm very, glad that I did because it's unbelievably empowering as an actor. I can imagine that's why a lot of people are here and why a lot of folks are wanting to do it. it the transformation is, is, is just enormous. Um, and so I, I really couldn't be happier to be producing, uh, yeah. Chase? I think it was a gradual descent into the ninth circle of, of hell. Because <laughs> I'm an actor, it's great, you get a job, they pay you, you can order PAs around, get me coffee, and then you're like, but oh man, I want to tell my story. So then you write something and you're like, I'm just going to become a famous screenwriter now. And then 
they're like, but we don't want to make this script about the girl that can't walk right. So then you're like, I got to raise the money myself. And then you raise the money and then you're like, but I want to direct what I wrote. And then you're totally screwed because then you really have to do everything. And it's, it sucks. So you got to the point where you're acting in front of the camera and you had to operate the camera at the same time and you realized you needed help. Something like that, yeah. yeah. But uh, no, it is very empowering. There's all these positive things, but it's, uh, you know, so hard. And I, like these guys, my wife, it, you know, produced the feature that we're just finishing. And, um, you know, I did a lot of the, the behind the scenes stuff, but it's just, it's, it's got to be the hardest job um, in the world. And the, and the good ones are really gems because that job can, you know, you can turn into like a total monster, animal, crazy person. So, Amy, you're not, so, you know. How do you know? We haven't it's worked true, together you might yet. be. Or you learn how to hide it really well. Um, Kate and Andrew, um, why? Um, it didn't occur to us <laughs> that maybe we needed one. We, uh, basically what everyone else just said is sort of how we arrived at being producers was we just had a project that we wanted to do. Um, we wanted to write it, direct it, create it, and the next thing we knew we were producing it and tearing our hair out and wondering <laughs> why we had made such a foolish decision. Um, yeah, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. <laughs> no, it's true. I think we became producers because there was the technology that didn't used to be there, which is YouTube, really. Um, I was like from the blogging generation and vlogging, which is video blogging. So we didn't have any training. We didn't go to school for this. But what we did have was a platform that was free that you could put stuff out and you didn't have to go do a showing of something. You didn't have to get into any festival. You could put it online, and if it was of quality, then people would watch it. So that's Even if it wasn't of quality, <laughs> people would watch it. If it had a screen cap of a girl falling off a table, too. Or a uh, cat. People watch that, <laughs> yeah. So it was there, and it was free. So that's why we produced. Amy, what about you? Well, I, I, I wanted to be a producer. Um, I like collaborating. Uh, I wanted to make films. I wanted to have some control. I'm a little bit of a control freak. I wanted to have some control over the kind of work I did. And um, I think my skill base, uh, which is I'm, I'm really good at a lot of things, but excellent at nothing, uh, has, has, has served me well. I, can, uh, I worked in the camera department. I can uh, drive a truck. I can, uh, I've AD'd. I can do just about everything fairly well, but I am not uh, an excellent actor. I'm not an excellent actor. So and that, that's, that, that works well. I don't, if I couldn't produce, I don't know what I would do. Maybe I would be a concierge or something. <laughs> Well, you, at least you could pay your rent if you did that. Um, exactly. <laughs> uh, now we get into a little bit of the what. And, and the big question that I'm going to ask you that we're going to break down into 25 easy pieces is, what does a producer do? Um, and along the way, if we don't answer it, please feel free to comment upon how many producers do you need? Uh, when do you need a lawyer? How do you get a lawyer? But that'll come down the road. So the, there's, there's, there's a few basic things, big things you have to do. You have to acquire, develop the material, pre-production, production, post-production. Post it's a lot of things. You've got to find the money. And, and roughly in the, we will try to go over them roughly in the order that they may occur. The first one is acquiring or developing the material, which means either you write an original screenplay or get one or adapt something. Um, you have to acquire the rights if you're going to adapt something, unless it's in the public domain. Um, that question that I asked before of everyone here, like, is your screenplay ready to shoot? I want to ask that question first of the panel. How do you know when a screenplay is ready to shoot? I, I didn't, I, I don't know, I, I hope it's okay if I answer this, but oh, um, mine was interesting because I didn't direct my own um, screenplay. I thought I was wearing enough hats and... Um, and I asked a friend, uh, Raquel Amazon, uh, who directed our film, to do it because she had gone to film school. So when we brought her on, everything changed in terms of the finality of that screenplay because she is the director and she, she, you know, she wanted to see, she, she had some ideas. She was like, oh, what if we see more of this, less of this, that, and, you know. So it was, it was really bringing 
that collaborator on, and I'm sure that's going to happen with whomever you're working with. If you're if you decide to if you decide to you're only going to write and you're going to get someone else to produce it, or you're you know, however many hats and whoever you bring along is going to determine when that screenplay is done. At least that was it with me. So you have to figure out who to trust, who should read it, who shouldn't read it. That's also important because you can really get led astray. Um, do you need a mentor or not? Yes? Yeah, I, the, I was in The Station Agent, which Tom McCarthy directed, great director. And, and I, writer. And great writer. And I gave him the cake eaters, and you know, he gave me lots of great feedback. I mean, scripts, to me, uh, wow, I wouldn't make it until you really feel like you've got it at a place where you can make it, because you, know, you guys know this, you can waste paper. But you know, in the post-production on a film that I, that I wrote and directed at this current point, you know, having conversations with our editor, uh, he said something really interesting that there's the film you write, the film you shoot, and the film you edit. You know, so in all three of those phases are a complete rewriting of the material. So I think starting out, you want to make sure the story is as strong and developing it as much feedback, negative and positive, and really make sure that you've really tried to get it right before you make it. Because if you have a great script, you're so far ahead of the game, but then so many things can go wrong when you actually make it. So starting out with the best thing is always yeah, the best they, bet. Yeah, they say it's, it's, it's very, very hard to make a good film from a bad script. You know, so Unless you're Bruce Willis. Exactly. But uh, I, I agree with that. You just work it, and, and finding a mentor or someone who's been in the industry, a, another writer, director, or something that, uh, whose work that you like and admire, you know, that's, you don't want to get Bruce Willis to read a script that's, uh, you know, quiet drama. You want to get the, the right, someone whose films you admire and, and get them to read it and take notes and push it as, what, what we always do when we're developing something is we, we, you know, we push, we push, and there's a point where we let it go. Maybe the script isn't 100%, but we can see that the, if it's a writer, director, that there's some things they're not gonna let go of, and it's like, okay, well, I, I, I can promise you that's gonna be taken care of in the other room, but sometimes, sometimes we just say like, okay, now, now we push it off and understanding that, there, that somebody needs to shoot that and go through that process, but we do push as hard as we can. And who shouldn't read it? I mean, should you give it to your mother or your... Uh lover or it's, your it's neighbor? Hard. I think reading a screenplay is its own art. You know, it's not a novel. Uh, it's a template for a film. And I think people who are in the habit of reading books, it's, you can get wrong advice if they aren't in the habit of reading scripts. Um, and you should probably not give it to people in the industry, like uh, um, companies. You know, don't uh, submit it uh, to focus features or um, to agents or something like that, particularly if it's your first screenplay and first film that you're making. Just wait until... Um, because you may think your script is ready or f far, far, much farther along than it is, and, and they will only read it once. Your name, your name goes into a database, and they, they, they have your name and the name of the script, and it won't... E even my company, we don't... It's very hard to get us to read something a second time. You so say, like, oh, like a year later, we have people come back, like, no, it's totally different. We totally rewrote it. Um, a film that we're, we're attached to now, they had sent it to me uh, a, year, a year and a half ago. I read it, and I was like, ugh, it needs so much work. And then it came back to me. They sent it back to me again. I didn't read it. I was like, ugh. And then uh, I was brought down to Austin, Texas, to be a part of a filmmaker workshop. And I ended up, their project ended up being m under my mentorship. And I was like, ah. And so I had to read it. And I was like, ah, so I was reading it on the plane. And then they actually did turn it around. And I was very glad that I was forced under those circumstances to read it again and meet with the filmmakers. And uh, based on my notes and the workshop that we did, they did a final rewrite that really took it to an amazing place. But I really, had I not been invited to that workshop, I never would have read that script a second time. And now I'm producing it. Wow. That is that's rare. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think it's, you, you hit on a really great point, though. If somebody reads your screenplay and they don't love it, they will never want to read it again. I mean, y you were trapped into it. You were on a plane going to meet the person and you found out you had to read it. I mean, that's really unusual. But so th think of that, you know, like you're going to get one shot, if, if that, and that's it. You know, you really, in the real world, you don't get a second shot. The other thing, and this is for really writers, not producers, and, I, and I, a lot of you have written here. 
Um, this has been my experience, and I'm guessing it might have been your experience and your experience and your experience. When you're, before you start writing, I mean, before you hit the first page of the outline, or maybe when you're writing the first page of the outline, or if you go right to screenplay, when you're writing the first page of the screenplay, somewhere in the very, very beginning, you lose all of your objectivity very early in the process. Um, I found this to be true with most people. So what, how do you get back or retain or do you use another person for a shred of objectivity? I mean, Amy can do it because she's not writing the screenplay. She's not a writer. She, she actually has a great advantage over you, 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 and you because you write. Um, how do you deal with that, you writers, you? Because they're writers. I guess going into this process of directing the you know, the last film I wrote, The Cake Eaters, and that was a bigger kind of scenario where I was definitely my first experience. So you, you're holding on to a lot of precious things and having big arguments and feeling like the embattled writer. And, you know, through that process, I hope I learned that you do have to have a lot of objectivity, especially if you're going to direct what you write. So I guess really just trying to be open to to, to feedback, which is hard, you know, when, when you hear all this feedback and really try to take it seriously. And then I guess in the, the filmmaking process, um, yeah, just try to be to open to ideas that your producers and your, your team are bringing you and to try to really, really think about, you know, what's important for the story and what versus what you're just in love with and you can't let go of, you know. What about comedy? Because you guys are writing uh, your submissions only is comedy. The, the rules are a little bit different. How do, how do you handle that? Do you, if you, if both of you laugh, it's in. If one of you laughs, it's not. How do you, or you, or you let the actors do it and see what it looks like. How do you, how do you write comedy? How do you well, know if it's working? We, because we've been working on the same. It's the same project. We just we're in post production for our third season, so it's the same world and. Um, we've all sort of acclimated to the temperature of the water. At first, um, it, it really was sort of discovering it as we went, not just as writers, but as filmmakers and editors. Like we wrote the pilot and we did a table read and it was sort of funny, but we were like, it will be funny. <laughs> and then uh, we shot it and we cut it and we were like, oh my God, people are taking so much time. And you know, we, we really sort of learned the rules of comedy as we went along. And so at this point, um, I, you know, I'll send the episode to Andrew once I've written it. I'll send it to, I'll show it to my, my real husband, uh, who's a, a, a great, Your other um, my other husband, um, who always has a, a really good objective eye. But we also have the benefit of this sort of immediate gratification because very soon after I write the episode, we're filming it. Um, and also I'm writing for specific people, so now I've got all of their voices in my head and Andrew's figured out how to edit the stories that I write, and um, so it's just been a very gradual process. So there are certain things now that I write, and if I handed it to someone who's never heard of the show, they'd say that's not, I don't, I don't understand why that's funny, and I'll be like, yeah, but wait till you hear Lindsay say it. Like, that's, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not writing for you, and this isn't for you to read, this is for you to see um, when, you know, when she does it. Uh, so that, you know, it's very specific to our particular world that we inhabit with the show. But that's a good point. I just want to interject that finding a group of people that you can give your scripts to, that you trust, that you know they're going to give you good notes, but they're not going to like, you know, you can hear a lot of bad, like criticism that isn't helpful. Right. You know, but like, you know, other writers who have sold things, people, actors you trust, you know, that you sort of, you know, I think I have probably like five people that I'll send something to when I really want to get honest feedback, but that I know won't, you know, cause me to want to kill myself. So, there, there, there's also people, and I know a few, you know, screenwriters with credits who've written big movies who will read something that I wrote, and they just say wonderful things about it because I, I learned after about the third or fourth time they just don't want to say anything negative. That's not helpful either, unless you just want to feel good for a while until the next person reads it. But you know, there, there's there's that to deal with. You were going to say something. You forgot, okay. Oh, no, um, okay. the thing about the mentor, actually, um, and I think this is what Jace was sort of, I think you were touching upon just finding your own voice, and um, it's interesting, because after, after a long, long time, you know, I've, I've been, by now, writing for like 10 years, and I, and I did initially stumble upon it, and so initially, I was like taking advice from these people, 
and um, because I, I didn't trust myself. And then after a point, I was like, oh my God, this is all wrong. There's like, my voice isn't left in it. And, um, and I thought it was a big deal when my, I, ha I, I do have a mentor and he, he's a big time screenwriter and <laughs> I sent him a, a scene that I wrote to open the screenplay and he, all he did was write back as like, this is crap. And I was like, no, you're wrong. This is, this is really, this is perfect actually. <laughs> and I left it in there and I, f and I went with my gut and I filmed it just to see how it would pace out, just, you know, myself with a camera. And it really, really worked. So it was like, that was a big deal for me, like just finding, sticking to my guts, you know, finding my own voice and, find, and, and really acknowledging, becoming professional kind of, you know? That's a good point, because a lot of times you'll, you'll line up some great famous writers, they'll read stuff, they'll give you certain comments, and they might, half of them might be wrong. I mean, you, you, it's a very hard thing to figure out, because especially when you start out, especially those of you who just have one or two screenplays, you know, if somebody famous says, this is wrong, who are you to argue with this person? And yet you might be right, so it's, it's, a, it's a very... Yeah, just because someone's like a big shot doesn't mean they, they understand what you're trying to do. I had one project go through the Sundance Lab and have really high profile Hollywood uh, advisors and the script came out of that lab much worse than when it went in. I was like, thanks, Sundance. I mean, it's not usually the case, but in this one particular case, the writer started listening and got a little confused because different mentors were saying different things and they wanted to uh, please people and it, uh, it just made a mess of the whole thing. I'll, I don't want to put down the Sundance Lab or any writer's no, workshop, I wasn't, yeah. but I had an experience I was in the Warner Brothers Writers' Workshop, which is very competitive. It's a TV writing workshop. They, they invite 5,000 people to submit, and they pick like 20. And so I got picked. I was so happy. And so did Mark Cherry and a few people who went on to have very big writing careers. Well, everybody who got in there wrote a really, at least one really good script to get in there. And I read all of them. Everybody did, you know, like half of them were pretty good, and the other half weren't bad. But we, and we all wrote scripts while we were there. There wasn't one good usable script of, of the 20 people at the end of that thing. Not one of them was even close to our third best script. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not uh, saying anything bad about the Sundance Lab. It's very helpful, and it's a very great thing in our industry to help filmmakers. It's, it is really the filmmaker's responsibility, too, to understand who to listen to, filter that, uh, feedback into their producer and their team that they're working with, and you know, it's, it's how uh, a filmmaker gets the right thing out of that lab. Um, this is a topic that we should spend about a year on, but we're going to have to move on now. Uh, the next big thing you're going to face after you've decided that your screenplay is ready to shoot is budgeting, line by line. Now, that's something that you may know something about or know nothing about. Let's start, let's assume that everybody here knows nothing about it. Give us a little primer, maybe go back to your first time. Like, how do you make a budget? And it's very important because if you do it wrong, you're completely messed up. Um, and you do it a lot, so we'll go to you last. So you've done it like for one feature. How did you learn how to do it? I Googled it. Yeah? <laughs> Budgeting and it worked. worked. You know, yeah, I, go I was like, how much does a makeup artist cost? And I like literally Googled that. And, really? and then we got this consulting producer um, joined us, Maitalee Weissman, who's produced a lot and very talented. And, and I was shocked. I, I was sure like she was going to take a look at that and be like, I can't work with you. And she looked at it. She's like, no, this is pretty good. And she gave me her first features budget. And it was, it was pretty much on the par. Wow. Yeah. Googled it. That's what, what did they I'm do? Gonna, I'm going to leave you? now. Huh? I'm, I'm going to leave now. I'm done. <laughs> I have nothing to add to that. Yeah, but you started but before there was true. Google, so, you know. But how do you, you know, how do you have access to these things? Yeah. You don't. And, and everything's changing year by year. You know, there's totally different cameras this year than there were last year, and there's totally different equipment. And, and it's almost like you can't, I was reading books from the 80s, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's true. It, uh, the, the pace of change has just accelerated so much. I mean, in the 80s, you could read a book from the 70s and make a movie. Now, you can't, you know? It, like, a five-year-old book is, like, too old. Um, Jace, what about your I adventures? I found that uh, it was the hard, like, it's the most mystical thing in the process is the budget for us. It was, like, the, the thing that you could never figure out, and the person that knew the information was off making a movie with, with Martin Scorsese. Like, the budgeting of a motion picture is a dark art that should be left... <laughs> to people like Amy. Thank and, you, that's and, what I And, and I behind, like, it's like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, like, 
if we could just get a budget, we could make it. Who do we go to? So we, we took out a budget from our friend, Patty, who's a producer, for a feature she did for $65,000. And we just sat at our kitchen table and opened up four laptops and we're like, well, that number sounds good. <laughs> And I mean, having some experience, uh, you know, plugging these numbers in, but I, I guess, you know, that's the thing, is when you do it that way, you obviously, and we had done it sort of guessed for some shorts and bigger things where you go like five or 6,000 over. And, you know, but a feature is like, I think we tried to get it to like 76,000 just for production. And then like, I get, you know, what's, it's really gonna be, it, it's impossible, like Amy will, probably give a much better answer, but when you have deferred salaries and what you're really getting and everything, the movie that we're making is like a $250,000 movie. But we did actual production for this certain number, and I think we went over like, you know, $10,000 or something, you know. But it's, it's really hard, yeah. But I think the, if you have a basic budget and you can plug in some basic numbers, depending, if you're not making a movie for a million dollars, if you're making it for like a hundred or $200,000, you know, there's just sort of basic numbers that even if you kind of screw up, you have a credit card, right, for $25,000 limit, so you'll be fine. Um, you also now, you, now Amy will give you the real answer. Wait, before we get to Amy, I wanna, I wanna get to the web series producers, but I wanna just say one thing. You brought up a very uh, important point, which I'm forgetting as I'm saying this. Um, I got it. The business about, like, don't go to the line producer who just did a budget for Martin Scorsese's $125 million movie. That person will screw you up. Find the person who has never done a budget for more than 100000 Maybe he's done one or two or three. That person will be helpful for your $100,000 film. Yeah, because they'll tell you, like, the movie we just made was budgeted at $2.7 million originally. And I just told you what we made it for. So, you know, and that budget was done by this guy, Chris Carroll. Great line producer, producer guy. But, you know, like, yeah, I would have loved to have had $2.7 million. But I chose, you know, I was driven to make it for this amount. So it's true, you know. Um, I want to add a short asterisk. That's an awesome budget. I didn't even have a thousand dollars to pay a line producer, and that is why I googled it. So, like, if you have that, totally go to someone who knows what they're doing. But if you don't, just Google it. You know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. I worked with a student two years ago from SVA who did a pretty good feature for three hundred dollars. I was just shocked. He got everybody to work for free. He had his own camera. He really worked on the thing. And in my film festival, I've shown films done for under $10,000 that have won Gotham Awards, that have been nominated for Spirit Awards. I mean, anything is possible. Everything is possible. Especially now. Yeah. I mean, it's true. Um, so don't feel that you're constricted. There, there are no rules, because the rules are getting broken and reinvented every week. Um, let's do the talk about web series, because we really haven't got there. How did you figure out how to budget that thing? Uh, there was no budget for our first season. It was all. We didn't plan out anything. There was no spreadsheet. It was, we had a camera and like a microphone on a boom pole, which was a painter's pole that I bought at Home Depot for $10. And a couple clip lights that we had interns who I found on Twitter holding up and lighting. And we made six 20 minute episodes on, and put it on YouTube for free. Uh, so there was no budget there. But then we did have money and it was... It got a little better. It got a little better. <laughs> um, the second season, we had our first budget, which still wasn't a lot of money, and we still didn't really have our spreadsheet. We finally got our spreadsheet for season three. Yeah. And that um, was overseen. Sorry, hun. It was overseen by my husband. Yeah, her real one. <laughs> he should really be here. Um, <laughs> and uh, and there's something to what you said. I mean, he's not a line producer. He's a lighting designer. But mm. he w knew what we were trying to accomplish and wanted to keep us safe and protected and was incredibly um, frugal and cautious with it. And we were able to make our eight episodes and stay and like come in under budget actually f mm -hmm. during production. So there is something to that like we don't know what we're doing, so let's be really careful. Um, There's also a great book for if there are any like cinematographers out there uh, who are working with like a lower budget like DSLR camera stuff. There's a book called DSLR Cinema by Kurt Lancaster who breaks down basically equipment depending on what your budget is from like 
like $5,000 to like $500,000 and will give you scenarios of equipment that you can use to keep you within a budget. It's a, I thought, really helpful because once we figured out how much like our cameras and lighting and sound would be, we could just wedge it in and see what kind of package you could come up with. So that was helpful. You can probably Google that too. <laughs> yeah, it's called DSLR Cinema. It's by Kurt Lancaster. And it takes a bunch of indie people who shot movies on like the 5D, Canon 5D and Canon 70s and like really souped up film shoots with really low costs. Good tip. Um, Amy, you're de dealing with uh, some, some bigger numbers. How do you uh, approach it? Well, I, I think it, in a way I'm gonna reiterate what these guys said. A, a good budget, I love budgeting, but a good budget <laughs> is um, basically a template for what you're trying to do. And a, a really good budget will be a narrative, you know. Okay, first we have a script, then we have a, then we're in pre-production. Where are we gonna, are we gonna have to have an office or can we do it out of our living room? So basically, if you can get a template for a, you know, a similar, what, even when I start a budget, I've, I've, uh, I did do two years ago a feature for 150,000. And, you know, if I'm budgeting something that's anywhere from 100,000 to, 800,000, I might start with that budget. And then you just go down and you fill it in. You think like, okay, how are we gonna do this? Is it, which SAG contract is this gonna be under? Which, you know, whatever. And I, after years and years and years of producing, I have budgets uh, of all different sorts. So I can think like, okay, well, this one's on location. This one's 1.5 million. I'm gonna start with this budget, you know? But maybe you can find someone who's done a film, you know, in that, in that range, but yeah, and I still Google stuff too, to be quite honest. <laughs> like, like, so I'm like, how would I do that? Or what are the, how much are the flights? Google's very handy. How much are the flights to Seattle? Or, you know, um, um, but really you just have to think of it as a, a very specific plan about you, how you move forth to make your film. Yeah, really, all the knowledge in the world is on the internet now. Uh, it wasn't true 10 years ago. Yeah. I, I, I had a problem with my car. I took it to the dealer, and they gave me a very unsatisfactory, expensive scenario where they said you could do nothing. And I, I wasn't satisfied with that, so I talked to a couple of experts. I really couldn't get an answer. And one of them said, just Google 997 slow crank. So I Googled that, and I got forums of people who had the same problems in England and in America, and, you know, like all these, I'm like, it's all there, you know. You just you just have to figure out which Google words to put in, and all the answers are right there. Um, let's and again, this is something we should spend a semester on, but we but we, but we'll we're just kind of touching on things here, so we have to move on here. Now, um, next we have attaching talent or casting. Um, how many people here have seen the movie Casting by? It just played on HBO. Marion Doherty, wonderful, wonderful film, right? I, I'm assigning you who haven't seen it, see it. Find a friend with HBO. Huh? You're screening it in November? Stacy, our fearless leader, just solves another problem. Uh, wonderful film. Wonderful film. Casting by. Just go to the website and you'll see it. It's on demand right now. It's on demand? Okay. Yeah, next. So you can... your movie. I almost rented it last night. I saw it on Which HBO one? like Love Maryland. a week yeah. or two ago. I mean, I saw it that, but the That's casting. It's a good one for actors to work. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, what that movie will just those 90 minutes will help you with casting and, and inspire you too, and, see, and you really see how people who know how to do it do it. So let's ask our producers, how do you cast? Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's how. Well, we um, we come from the theater community, which is um, a very tight knit in comparison. Uh, to the film TV world. It's a very tight-knit community. And so initially, we just looked within our own Mutual circle friends, of friends, literally. people we've worked <laughs> with, um, and just asked them, like, hey, you want to do this? Because again, when we first started out, we had no idea that we were going to continue. We were just making this one episode. We were going to throw it against a wall, see if it stuck. So um, it was really just, well, let's call in some favors. and. And that continues to be how we cast most of the roles, are just people we know, people we've worked with. People we're fans of. People we're fans of. But as the show has evolved, uh, and if you watch it, and I hope you will, um, you'll notice that we get 
some fun little celebrity cameos in the show. Um, and for our third season, we did actually hire a casting director and gave her our wish list of people that we'd just love to get on the show. And she went to them uh, with just direct offers. We've never held auditions for the show. Um, we really never budgeted time for that. And also, there's just, it seems at this point, it still seems like an endless supply of talented people that we either know or know indirectly. Also, our show is about largely auditioning and about the casting process. So us having auditions was just like way too meta, like brain explosion. And like, yeah. who do we really think we are? Like, we're a little um, We're at a panel discussion. That's, yeah, come on. I'm come sorry. On. We're, no. My mic doesn't have a cord. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, Chuck, we had a very similar experience for our, our film, for our first feature. We, we had worked with or admired so many talented folks that we, same, same sort of story, we just asked folks directly, uh, which, which worked out really beautifully. And of, of course there's going to be times where someone else on board, maybe a director is looking at an actor who's different and you've got a bit of a debate going on. And Viviana held us back for a long time, which was really smart, on, on casting some of um, the, the, the roles that were, not, um, that were not the lead, some of the ones that were, were just day players or um, a line here, a line there. And it's a good thing because there were, there were occasionally times where we inadvertently made an offer to someone only to find that that role was written out of the next draft. So it was, uh, luckily that only happened once, um, and that was because we, as a team, overstepped our bounds. So it was really important for us to kind of keep a lid on that and, and really proceed cautiously throughout. I have a, a strong opinion about it because I feel like if you have the money to make your movie, um, in this climate, like the last film we made, it was just so amazing. We, I'm a big believer in casting directors um, and New York actors, being you guys being many of them, uh, best actors around. So you hire a good casting director, and if you have your money, uh, the last film, the one that we're just finishing, I was so stunned because I felt like it was just a, a, a kind of a bigger home movie, just purely looking at the budget. We, we had Daphne Rubin Vega, who is a friend of mine, who had been involved for a while, and our casting director put it out on breakdowns for some of the other parts, and I was just so stunned with the level of talent that was submitted, like, mind-boggling. Like, we ended up casting Tamara Tooney. I don't know if you guys know, she's amazing, and, you know, her agent had submitted her. So I feel like if you have the money and you can get a casting director and you can put it out there, you will find, like, amazing people submitted for your project, you know, assuming that it's good, and I'm sure that it will be. So that's my take on it there. And, Amy could probably speak to development. Like, my other script is a bigger script, and we've been trying to attach actors, um, which is a whole other ball of, of wax. And we have, like, Patricia Arquette and some other amazing people. But then it's kind of strange, because you have a casting director, but it's really, like, agents. And, you know, it's, like, kind of the sad reality. Agents and power brokers who are sort of casting your movie based on, like who they will allow to attach and what money you can raise based on this person. And that's kind of a, a, like a, to me, a more complicated, harder thing because, you know, I find it's really cool if you, if you have the money and you hire the casting director and then you have like classic auditions, I think it's really cool. But the other part is, is a trickier thing and I feel like a lot of bigger movies get made in that other way. Thus, a lot of us don't get a lot of opportunities because the reality is they have to cast big stars to get foreign money. So they're already cast by the time like we walk in the room to read for the one little part. I agree with all of that. <laughs> but I can elaborate. Um, you know, each film is different. So uh, I worked on, the, the film I did called Gaby, uh, which was 150,000, um, which did extremely well. <laughs> Um, the director, Jonathan Lasecki, was himself an actor and also worked uh, in a management company and he had a ton of friends in the theater community and literally, uh, with the exception of a child actor who we went to a, someone who specializes in casting children, um, he would say like, oh, I know so-and-so, it was, it was like that. And um, uh, so that was pretty easy. Um, but I am generally pro-casting director. Um, 
Uh, it brings new ideas, new thoughts, and so, sometimes it's people we already know, but then we're like, oh, we didn't think of that. You know, so uh, if you in any way, shape, or form can afford, afford a casting director, I think it's, uh, it's a really, really good way to go. Um, I think, you know, the whole process with agents, whether, whether you know, you're already greenlit to make your movie or mm -hmm. whether your development is um, infuriating, frustrating, uh, just as everyone says. Um, I have good relationships with a lot of agents and um, that's helpful because uh, I, even if I have a casting director, I'll make that, if it's important to me, I'll make that call myself to the agents and I think that's, that's really meaningful. So even if you have a casting director and you're a producer, um, it, I think it behooves you to get on the phone and get out there and be very involved with it. Um, uh, yeah, the whole attaching actors is, it's, you know, chicken and egg, crazy, very hard. You know, and they're, they are protecting their clients, you know, from being, uh, you know, attached willy-nilly and protecting their name from being, uh, you know, uh, out there too much. But, um, one thing that is infuriating for me is when emerging uh, directors and writer directors come into my office and I talk to them about a project and they're like, you know, I'm thinking about Johnny Depp for that part and then, you know, so after that part, I'm just like, you know, you know, let's find a way to make your film with people who are really good and really right for the part, you know, particularly if it's your first film. Um, these actors aren't gonna work with first-time directors. It's, it, unless there's some rare, weird circumstance, it's very, very unlikely it will happen. And I'm not being pessimistic, I'm just being realistic. It's better to make your film than go through a two-year frustrating casting process and end up right back where you should have been in the first place, making the film with the right actors for the right part. Give us an example, your film that just played in Toronto, Tony Collette. Thomas Hayden Church. Oh, yeah. How did okay. you get them? How did, how did they come that come That was a long process. So the, the writer producer um, who I came on to the project, but she had been working on the, she wrote, she was an actress, actually. This is, now this is relevant. She was an actress um, and she was not working a lot. So she What's wrote a, uh, Emily Wachtel. Mm -hmm. She uh, wasn't having much luck. She was getting some small parts. She wasn't working a lot. So then like it sounds like many people, wrote a script for herself um, based on her experiences. This was all before I met her. Um, she brought a director on. Uh, he said, well, let's make it with, you know, she, he convinced her to not act in it and just come and, and produce and so that they could cast someone who could finance the film. The film was budgeted at, I don't, before, right before I came on, between three and five million dollars. Um, the director brought me on. Uh, she had, in the meanwhile, been talking to Thomas Hayden Church, so she grew up with uh, the Newmans, with Paul Newman, so that was a, a, a big help. <laughs> uh, and Paul, before he died, had read the script and um, helped her reach out to Thomas Hayden Church directly. Uh, so he was already attached. Then I came on and said, look, uh, we tried to raise $3 million for a little while, like you do, and then we're like, okay, you know, screw it, we're gonna make it for what we can, and we raised some money. And we started just going out to actors, but uh, again, uh, I, we had a casting director, but I made the calls myself. So I called Tony Collette's agent. She was like at the top of our list. Uh, we, we, I called the agent, um, you know, and went through that route. And then some of the other actors came through her making uh, direct calls uh, with the help of Joanne Woodward, who remained on as a producer. So we did a lot of it ourselves, but our casting director also held auditions. There was a part of a um, you know, 25-year-old kid, and she, our casting director found someone for that. You know, we had extensive auditions. We were shooting in Seattle, so we had to do Skype interviews. Uh, um, how do we get Nina Arianda? We got this amazing actress, Nina Arianda, who's in Venus and Fur. Um, she, he, she was just like on our list or something. And we, again, we called the agent. We did a lot of it ourselves in conjunction with our casting agent, basically. Now, we, we've hit just three of the, the big headings and, and there's a lot more. Finding the money, which we're okay. gonna go to next. Um, Pre-production, production, post-production, post selling your film, marketing and distribution. This is gonna take us two years. But <laughs> since we, talked about the screenplay, out of all these things that we're gonna go through, what is the most important thing? And we've talked about casting. What is the first most important thing and the second out of all these things? Can I just add something yeah. really quickly for casting? When you do 
just please remember um, minorities because I, I totally, we totally didn't talk about that, but that was the whole point of my film. Interesting. How minorities... Get forgotten. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, but please do remember that. <laughs> Unless you're making a film in Norway, I guess, then they... Or but, Seattle. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, that is a great point. And, and really, productions that sort of ignore that will reach a, a, a fork or a point or a brick wall where they're just damned. I mean, just hell reigns upon them because they, they kind of shut everybody out. And, well, there's uh, a good SAG initiative, right? That uh, the diversity casting, which as a producer, I find appealing. <laughs> so it, the, the SAG thing is, fa is fantastic for us. We were like, okay, because it, it made us think about that. We're like, oh, okay. Uh, it, there's some financial benefit, but then, but it, it, it helped us keep our mind open to that and, and work harder for it, you know, to make those percentages. For our film, we, we made a point of casting um, people who had the right energy for the role. Instead, we, we couldn't afford a casting director either. Um, but yeah, who had the right energy amongst our friends for the role instead of, a, you know, the color of their skin or their background or where they're from. So we ended up having a huge mix of just roles you wouldn't, you know, minority actors in roles you really wouldn't see because Hollywood hasn't trusted that the audience will go with it yet. And it's been amazing to watch, you know, people just go right along with it and, and pretty much love it, like everyone who's watched the film. Right, or they typecast, like you can be a terrorist, but you can't be a doctor. Yeah, yeah. well, the film's about typecasting. Right. <laughs> and your film is about auditioning and your web series. Oh. Very interesting. Uh, and you're all actors, so how did we get to... Right where you know. Isn't this strange? Isn't this unusual? Uh, th the point I wanted to make, though, is that of all these things you have to do to make a movie or anything else, I, I, I just want to make the point, the two most important things, I think the most important thing is the screenplay, and I think the second most important thing is the casting, and I think if you don't get those two things right, you just, you cannot make a good movie. You know, I think the most important decision a director makes is casting. It's, it, it really is. It makes it... Uh, a huge difference ca doing uh, casting well. Absolutely. So let's move on to the topic, which I know many of you are just waiting here with bated breath. Um, oh, we left out assembling a crew. I'm sorry. Uh, can, can we spend a few seconds on that before we jump into the next major category? Does anybody have a quick how you assemble a crew story for their project? I would say if you're you know, venturing into to all of this, start building a team. You know, uh, like a, a get to know a DP that you work with, um, you know, a costume designer, a production designer. And, you know, as you're working on shorts and different things, you're going to like people and carry them on to other things with you. So you build up this team. So when you're ready to make your feature, you sort of have a creative group that you've sort of built around you that you trust that are going to, you know, make something as crazy as a feature film with you. So th that's kind of how you know, we got that, that team together. And then, you know, when you, your budgets get bigger and you start filling, you know, lots of those positions with, you know, unknown people, you know, you, the quality, you know, of the whole project gets raised because you start, you know, having that. And you bring those people you know, along with you and you trust yeah. them. And um, both, both Seattle and Austin, Texas, where I've worked, have uh, amazing uh, communities of filmmakers that help each other. Uh, the director of Lucky Them, Megan Griffiths, uh, came up has a deed for Lynn Shelton, another director that works in Seattle, and produced for her. And Lynn Shelton came to our set and took stills, and they all help each other out. And I, I found that so inspiring. Um, the the director of uh, Gaby, Jonathan Lasecki, took his short film to like 50 film festivals and hung out and met people and met other directors. And uh, our DP on Gaby was uh, a director in his own right from Austin, Texas. We, we brought him up and put him on a couch. And you know, uh, so just building that community, whether it's through film festivals or working on short films and going out and just meeting all of those people, it's a fantastic way to, to build a crew. Um, the... Um Okay, let's get to the, this is, this is a, a giant topic. Again, we should spend a year on it, but we'll, we'll, we'll do it in 10 minutes or 15. Um, finding the money. How many people here are wondering about finding the money? Let's talk about that. I think you should also put next to finding the money uh, two important words, and, and those are combining resources. I think uh, if you start thinking about it, it's not just the money, it's, it's, there's, there's many, many ways to do it, many creative ways to do it. Um, and the other thing, you brought up a great point about bias, and I'm glad you did, because 
there is a bias against, I, I assume most of you are making original stories. Is anybody here making a sequel? Raise your hand. Is anyone here making a comic book? Raise your hand. Is anyone here making a bestseller? Raise your hand. Is anyone here making a video game? Raise your hand. Well, then you just can't work in Hollywood. That's it. That's the reality. Now, this wasn't true 30 years ago. Um, there's, there's a few things you're going to run into that you should know about. Um, some uh, ROI. Who doesn't know what ROI means? Raise your hand if you don't know what it means. Don't be bashful. ROI. Return on investment. When you go to investors and they say ROI, you better know what they're talking about. Um, and the other thing, the other three things that you're going to run into is Hollywood. The whole business is based on pre-awareness uh, and a word that I don't think it's a word, but I'm making it a word. It's called pre-soldness. I think you know what pre-sold means, but pre-soldness is the word that I want you to write down. And the third thing which you've all heard is branding. And so everything is you know, based around that. That's how they, nobody has, I mean, there, there, actually this fall, there might be one or two original stories that are, might get nominated for awards and make some money, but it, it, it's a rare occurrence. Um, the um, original stories are the least desirable properties in the marketplace. Um, in 1981, 30 years ago, seven of the top 10 grossing films in this country were original screenplays, original stories. Seven out of 10. All right, if you, two, two, 30 years later, 2011, raise your hand if you want to take a guess. How many of the top 10 were original stories? Anyone want to take a guess? One. Well, you're close. It was zero. Were you reading Linda Opst's book or something? Huh? Were you reading Linda Opst's book? Uh, no, actually, she probably has a ton of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, in, it's in her book, yeah. Uh, one, Sleepless in Hollywood. And I'll Sleepless. ask one more question. 2012, how many of the top 10 in 2012 top 10 grocers were original stories? Anyone want to guess? Zero, absolutely right. So in the last two years, zero in the top 10. I think last, 2011 or 2012, Bridesmaids was like 14. But that's not exactly a little independent movie. Uh, so that's really, when, when you talk to investors about movies, they're gonna be talking about, oh, like Batman, right? Or like, um, you know, whatever, whatever their uh, reference point is to some giant, you know, because that's what people see. 95% of the people in this country only see those movies. They don't see all the movies that you're making. They won't see the movies that you're making. They don't want to see the movies that you're making. And you have to bust through that. So um, it, it, it takes, uh, I think it's just good to be aware of that. I don't want to like pop everybody's balloon. But if I can talk you out of making your movie, then you shouldn't be making a movie. Um, so let's, um, these will get lumped together. So I'll just read the, the major headings of what we should cover here. Uh, private investors, pre-sales, tax rebates, crowdfunding, grants, and we'll talk about web series, we'll work that in, and creative funding ideas. So let's start with private investors. And tell us about what is a, a, what is a sophisticated investor and what is an unsophisticated investor, and tell us about your relationships with investors. You've all had relationships with investors, haven't you, or most of you? Well, <laughs> before 2008 was a good time for in unsophisticated and sophisticated film investors. When, when we made uh, our other film, The Cake Eaters, I had the good fortune of, of meeting uh, a lovely gentleman that runs a hedge fund who was crazy enough to put up $2 million for a movie. Um, I find these people are harder to find these days. Um, but uh, if you know a wealthy banker friend, I'd invite him over for dinner. <laughs> So that's the easy way to do this. Now, now tell us about the real way to do this. Um, Amy, do you go out and look for $2 million lumps from rich people, or what do you do? No, I mean, I look for what's a appropriate for the film. You know, I don't, I, I'm very responsible to investors. And for, for example, Gaby was a first time feature director. We had some, uh, you know, theater actors, no known actors, and uh, $150,000 was the right budget for it. I felt like I could, I could re recoup, I could uh, pay my investor back, at, which we did. And, um, you know, so I look for what's, what I feel is appropriate, what the mar I think about the marketing of the film and who might distribute it and what, what the hopes are. I mean, to make a $2 million film, is that's getting a little more, you know, rare. A lot of the independent films are being made for less than a million dollars. Um, 
Wait, and I think what you have, one thing I want to say is I, you have to respect your investors. A lot of people are like investors or give us the money. Like, but I, I have great respect for investors because they're usually doing it for you, for your film. Um, uh, it's, you have to be upfront with them. You have to say you, it's a very good chance you may lose your money. Um, anyone who runs a hedge fund knows that. Um, the cat's kind of out of the bag. For anyone who's a savvy financial person, they're going to know it's a high risk. So what you have to appeal to is, you know, their passion. You have to talk to them and see what they feel they might get out of it. It's like, do they want to come to the premiere? Do they want to come to set? Do they want to meet celebrities? Do they, uh, you know, what do they hope to get out of it? And a lot of times when I look at a project um, with an emerging director or emerging talent, I say, okay, what is the subject matter? You know, is it about someone who... Uh, you know, is suffering from MS. So, like, maybe the investor has something at stake in that topic. Or, uh, you know, or Lucky Them had a lot to do with the music industry. Like, who, who in that world might be interested in that? So, you know, do your research. Um, know who you're meeting and, and what they hope to get out of it. Um, respect these people. And, you know, work to make the budget so that you can, you know, because if you do what, what a lot of us call in the industry, burn an investor, it makes everyone mad. So burning an investor is taking $2 million for Gaby uh, when I don't think I could recoup that because then that investor may not ever invest in the film again. Whereas we are responsible, we pay people back. They're like, okay, I didn't make a ton of money. It, d it didn't change my life, but it was a good experience. I got paid back. I got 10%. Um, and I have an executive producer credit, and I got to tell my friends I produced a movie, and you know that the, those investors are happy. So yeah, just it's it's a uh, don't think it's like us against them. It's it is a certain kind of collaboration. And what if you take money from somebody? Uh, I I don't know what the percentage is, but let's just say half the people in America who are really wealthy didn't get it in the uh, most legal way and when they give somebody money for something, they expect something in return, and if they either don't get their money back, or they don't love your movie, or they don't love the way they've been treated, or somehow they thought they were gonna get to choose who plays the lead, and they were gonna get to choose what scenes, they were gonna do the final edit of the film, and they were, you know, if you don't get all these things in your own mind really clear, what can happen is pretty scary. Yeah, you need to just be super, super, super clear. You know, get 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 this in in writing. You know, do an agreement with your investor, obviously, but also just be super, super clear with them. Besides, even if the agreement goes between lawyers, just make sure that they understand that. Like, you know, talk them through it in a in just a comfortable, positive way. You don't have to be like, you aren't gonna have. You know, just say this is what we'd like to do. We we hope to. We, you're, we value your opinion. You know, we hope you'll put in some ideas, but you know, of course, the final choice is ours. Um, you'll be getting an executive producer credit. We may have to have one or two other people on the same card at the beginning. I just find it so much easier to have that conversation at the beginning than uh, at the end when they just when people can get very unhappy and then they won't invest again and they. It's it's better if they show up at your premiere at Sundance or whatnot and they're super happy and they. Uh, bring their friends, and their friends might want to invest in another film. It, it's it's a it's it is important to be collaborative and transparent and and open about it. And I have some investors I know, uh, uh, not on my films of course, who haven't gotten their money back, and um, uh, but they got the credit and they were treated respectfully by the filmmakers, and they're still interested in in the industry and being involved because it was a a, a good experience. Now we're starting to touch on some of those questions, like how many producers? I, I read today that Butler had 41 producers on it. I guess I didn't watch the movie and see the credits, but 41 producers is a lot of producers. I'm guessing they all didn't make the movie. Um, and uh, I don't, since we are dealing here in the lower budget range, uh, I don't know if too many people are gonna be dealing with the issue of pre-sales, but just tell us what pre-sales are, just so we know what that is. So pre-sales pre is where, you know, you do get Johnny Depp for your film and uh, Brad Pitt, or it's usually actors that are known abroad. F Sometimes it's not the stars you expect, uh, but it's or actors. Or foreign actors. You bring in foreign, foreign actors, actors or, in Germany. And yeah, or maybe here. we get a huge German actor, then right. you can pre-sale Germany. So what you would do is attach uh, 
a foreign sales agent, and then they go to these markets like AFM or Berlin or uh, Toronto, and they uh, do pre-sales. So basically, they say like uh, they'll go to the BBC and say, you know, I've got you know, um, you know, Tilda Swinton for the film. Um, how much will you guys give me ahead of time? And uh, sometimes they just give you a piece of paper that says we will, but we guarantee that we'll buy your uh, film for $100,000 for British television, and then you can take that to an investor or bank or something and get that money cash flow. Um, it's a very uh, long, painful, tedious process that can take, uh, you know, a year. You know, it's a year's worth of markets, um, starting with uh, Berlin in February. Um, uh, you know, uh, AFM is in November, um, and it's like a, as a filmmaker, you don't want to go to those markets. It's like a carpet sales convention or something. There they are like, a, we got a th thriller and a horror film and a comedy, and a, you're just in the mix of that. They're just like selling, selling. Though there are, you know, there's super classy sales agents too who um, maybe take a little more care. But the, the point being, unless you can get those actors or you have a, hardcore genre horror film or something like that, something that can be sold sight unseen that's not execution dependent, as they say. Um, it's, it's a very hard process. But half the films in the world are made that way. Yeah, bigger films are definitely made that way. I mean, if you have a film that's, oh, I, I don't know, $5 million film or whatever, a absolutely, that's, that's the process you'll go through. Um, next we have... I just want to add, it's oh, a difficult ahead. process for American, any yeah, American yeah, stories, yeah, any American dramas. Yeah, yeah. Comedies are, are like impossible. E extremely difficult Good to point. get any there's kind of There's certain things, yeah, like uh, American comedies because they'll say that, oh, the comedy might or might not translate, they don't know. They'll say it's a domestic play. Or um, I have one uh, project that has an all African American cast. Um, and even though I have Viola Davis and Kerry Washington attached, people are like, no foreign salespeople will touch it. They're just really? like that. We don't know that that's going to translate, you know. So there's certain like rules to the game that make it hard. But if you're doing a, a, a European film or they 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 make films by co-productions all the time. Or genre. Genre, a genre, absolutely, like uh, horror, uh, dark thrillers. Um, mainly. <laughs> next, uh, and again, this is uh, may not apply to everybody, but we should mention it because it's very important. Tax rebates. Um, certain states in this country will give you 20, 30, 40, 45 percent of your budget if you set it up in a certain way. Uh, the hot states now are Louisiana and New Mexico, but talk about those New hot York. states. And New, New York. York. New York's coming along. New York's is a great one. Yeah. I, our movie, I was so proud we used the New York tax rebate on our film. So for Gaby, us. Gaby, $150,000 movie. Yeah, it was huge. We're getting like 30 some $40,000 back from it's New York. It's not too small for the New York uh, state rebate. And they also have a post only credit now yeah. that's phenomenal. So we shot our film in um, Seattle. Uh, the Washington state credit is 30%. And they pay out approximately 30 days after you turn in your paperwork. So we used our rebate from shooting to pay for post, which we got a 30% rebate on. <laughs> so we just kept it moving. <laughs> and we got a loan based on our, yeah, uh, yeah. our rebate calculation. But yeah. in New York, I know we won't get ours, and this is the downside for two, we won't get ours for two years. Yeah, it takes a long time in New York. Yeah. Washington State, awesome. But they're super nice in New York. They're very nice, we love them, we love them in New York. And, um, yeah, the, the post-only credit is fantastic. Yeah, and I, I was surprised because we're doing this film, it's like, you know, at the time we went into shooting, it was $100,000, should we bother? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And I want to add, for our size film, like, like your size film, you, you think I shouldn't do this because yeah. I'll spend more money. But when you, when you really research it, and it's good to have that like, person on your team that's got more of a business mind, um, you know that they, because it's not that hard like you have to in New York State You have to do one day in a studio and you have to do a set build and raise three walls So we had a doctor's office scene and a courtroom scene So we were able to use uh, like East of Hollywood in Brooklyn And it's like fifteen hundred dollars for the day to do a set build and you spend like three hundred dollars on the plywood That your production designer buys and paints to build a doctor's office and then you know that you, know, you have to shoot a three-page scene on that studio, and that entitles you to qualify for, you know, 30% back. Yeah. So it's a pretty big deal. On qualified expenses, it gets kind of complicated about what's qualified and what isn't, but basically it's all below the line that is, most of below the line is qualified. They have a form and they'll uh, help you. They were super helpful and we, d I did, my uh, producing partner and I did all the paperwork ourselves. We're not, uh, 
accountants. Um, <laughs> it got bounced back a couple times. They were like, you didn't fill out this. We're like, ah. Oh. But uh, uh, it, was, it was simple enough that we could do it, and it's, it's totally, totally, totally worthwhile. And you can tell your investors, too. Like, that's how, you know, we, we still have to raise more money for Post, but you can say, hey, I'm going to get $40,000 back, and, you know, this is the, pa the paper from New York State. And can you loan me that money at 2% or 1%? You know, I, th those are ways to sort of incentivize people. The, and these are all, by the way, reasons to have more than one or two or three producers, because let's say you have a friend or you introduce yourself to a producer who just did this once. Yeah. If you've done it once, it's really easy to do a second time. Make them a producer on your film. Say you are a producer, I am a producer, you are a producer, you have another producer, and that way you don't have to do everything yourself. Because if you really, as you know, if you really do absolutely everything yourself, at some point, you know, it's too I much. Mean, but, you know, 41 producers is... That's too many. Somewhere between two and 41. Kind of mitigates what I do. <laughs> Um, but that was a $25 million film, and it was, you know, very difficult. They couldn't get foreign pre-sales because it was American, and, you know, it was a challenge. Um, so tax rebates, get into that or find somebody who knows it, partner up with them, that's a part of it. All right, now, a big one now, crowdfunding. You did Kickstarter. Um, I read today that Kickstarter, 39% of the projects on Kickstarter get funded. On Indigo... Um, Indigo, 10% get fully funded, but many more get partially funded. Um, and then there's this new thing that um, the government is gonna have called Jumpstart Our Biz Startups Act, which is, is going to make it so you can like raise money without hiring a securities expert. You can, um, it, it's, so tell us about crowdfunding and start with your experience. What was your experience with Kickstarter? What did you do, how did you do it? Yeah, so I'll talk about that. Um, so we did, we did two rounds of Kickstarter. We did one to fund production, and then we did another one a year later to fund post. And whew, you guys, you gotta you got be ready. You gotta be ready to do this, because it will kill you. It's, ex it's, it's, yeah. just, it's just exhausting. Um, it's, it's totally exhausting, um, but it's absolutely worth it. How much did you raise your two offerings? We, uh, both times $10,000, which is what our goal was, and we, we raised like a little bit above it. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a miracle that you've got hundreds of people that are giving you money and then aren't actually investors, so even better, because it's still, it's still your owned project. Um, but it's, you have to, you have to, have to, have to give it your all for those 30 days or those 60 days. You know, 39% of them are, are successful. We, we've, we've been aware of a lot of projects, of course, that, that haven't. And you see the video and you're like, wow, this video is really good. Why did they raise six dollars? And it's <laughs> perhaps because there wasn't a concerted effort throughout the entire process to raise the money. I think folks sometimes rely on that initial push, but I mean, we we were you know you just you email everybody you know, you send the Facebook personal invites, um, and you work it until it happens. I mean, we've seen sometimes situations where people have have set as a goal a number that seems very, very high, and particularly for something like Indiegogo where you don't have to raise all the money. And I think that can be kind of seductive. You're like, okay, well, I don't have to raise all the money. I may as well you know, put in $75,000 or something, or $275,000. But then there's a bit of a credibility issue, I think, because you look at the project and you say, well, are, are these filmmakers serious? Do they know what they think they can actually raise? Do they know what their project needs? And so I think being really conscious of setting a reasonable goal and, and determining for yourself how much can we really raise in this time. Um, and just, I wanna say one more thing, because we did do it twice. It, so we did our second campaign a year later, and I said to myself, and I think we collectively said to ourselves, well, it's been a year, and we made the movie, and we've got a lot to show for, it, and we've got this sort of trailer, and we really did make a movie, and all these people, 180 people that are invested are gonna wanna throw us $25 or $50 again. Why not? They can see that their, their money did something great. Not a lot of people that gave us money the first time gave us money the second time. We raised our $10,000, but primarily from totally different people. So I, for me, that was a reminder that no one cares about your project as much as you do. And even if someone has been there and invested in it at some point, they, that may not continue. People have a lot in their mind. I mean, there's probably a thousand new projects on Kickstarter, for example, every day. So just being aware of that, being super realistic and really diligent 
Because, yeah, it takes a lot of work, but it's definitely worth it. I mean, we raised most of the money that we needed for the movie. We did through crowdfunding. I mean, it's a miracle. We made a feature film with other people's money, and it's still our project, and it looks great. So. Well, I wanted to say something real quick, um, only because I've seen something recently where I'm getting an email uh, from a friend three days before their project is, like, mm -hmm. finishing, and it's in a group email with like 50 other people, and it's just like a form. And, and I felt like, like doing the Kickstarter thing was our first step with being a producer and having those spreadsheets. Like I had spreadsheets of my Gmail contacts that I printed out, and I checked each one, and I wrote a very personal email to each one of like, That's I think it was like 500. Smart. That's super yeah. smart. I delete the group ones. Yeah, just delete them. Of course. I get too many emails. Yeah. But if someone writes me a personal note, I'll, I'll stop and read. Yeah, and I, and I think that's why we made it the first time, like, yeah, I'm, I'm really good at that grunt work type thing, and it was a lot of work, but I did it. Yeah. A couple more things about uh, Kickstarter, another statistic. Once you get to 25% of your money, you have a very good high percentage of succeeding. If you don't get to that first 25%, when you hit $2,500, you were in a, your odds of success were pretty good. Wish I knew that before. Well, those are the statistics. <laughs> and the other thing is, if you're doing it for 10,000, you got a real shot. If you want thirty or forty thousand, it is much, much, much harder. The statistics of raising that kind of money are much lower, unless you're Spike Lee and you want a million dollars. And even Spike Lee had to be on the media. He had to be, you know, hugging the Knicks every day. He had to like, you know, kiss up to everybody to get his, you know, million dollars on Kickstarter. But again, you got to be Spike Lee to do that. And he, he, he worked hard for like sixty days or whatever that was. You could watch it inch up, you know. So. Um, what about, have you worked on crowdfunding? We sure Tell did. Us about um, it. The first season, like we said, we didn't have a budget, but then after we had completed the first season, it was recommended to us that we do a Kickstarter campaign if we wanted to do a second season. And so we did. We set our limit at 15000 and we made twenty two five. Wow. And you know, did what we did with that. But you had the pre, let's go back, the pre-awareness, the pre-soldness, the oh, branding. Oh, absolutely. You had been on We had your, a fan base. Right. We, and we had something to show. Yeah, right. I mean, and I would say, all, I mean, I don't know the percentage, but I would say most of the people who contributed were already fans. And, and that is why we were convinced to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, a good friend of mine said, you're crazy not to do this because... You ha it's there, it exists, right. and people want more of it. I say to you, to the people who just say, please believe in this, I promise it's gonna be great. I mean, that is a, that is a feat. I mean, at the very least, we had, like you said, the credibility of you know, some, you know, a proven product already. Um, but we went back and mm -hmm. did it again for season three. And we raised $62,000? Wow. Wow. I think it's in the top 10 web series like raised in 30 days, which was kind of cool. But I will say you had to be, the second time around, because we had already asked a lot of these people, we had to be super creative. Um, and it wasn't just sending a personal email. Like, Did you I give them prizes if they gave a certain oh, amount? Yeah, there was a lot of incentivizing, but actually much less incentivizing the second time around just because it was so much work the first time. Oh my God, don't do t-shirts. Don't do t-shirts or <laughs> lip gloss or like frisbees because they'll sit in your apartment. I think it's so easy. <laughs> Um, but what would I you remember. suggest? What do you what do you do? Sneakers? Well, like again, it sort of depends on the project itself. But we were trying to think of what is valuable or what is appealing about our show to our fans, and it's a lot of like contact with the people who are in it. So personalized Facebook, uh, Facebook messages videos. and you know digital downloads of the songs and things that we didn't have to like send to a manufacturer that we could provide but didn't much. cost us a lot of money but actually had more of a personal impact anyway than a magnet. Also, I remember like in our final week we were still I think like $10,000 behind and it's where you have crazy ideas. Uh, for instance, I like a year ago, I started like a Twitter hashtag, which sounds like so young of me, but it was called Saturday Intermission Pictures, oh, yeah. hashtag SIP. And uh, I started it, it was every Broadway cast would at intermission take a random picture of themselves and post it on Twitter with that hashtag. Uh -huh. And in our final week, we decided to like hijack it because it had gotten a lot of attention. It was like talked about on Jimmy Fallon. 
And in our final week, we, deliver, we delivered signs to every Broadway stage door that said, we love submissions only, and with a link to our Kickstarter. And so we had people like Ricky Martin holding up the signs and Cheetah Rivera. And they were like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, meanwhile. I don't, cheese. <laughs> cheese. <laughs> but it, it not only, I think, gave us a lot of attention for money, but it was noticed throughout the community. And actually, it, during our Kickstarter, we were approached by um, Kevin McCollum, who's the Broadway producer of like Rent in the Heights, uh, Motown, Avenue Q. Q. And from like the exposure that we had gotten throughout the community and the sort of notoriety that this many people are paying attention, he was like, how much do you really need to like do what you want to do? And basically took what we made on Kickstarter and then enhanced it to kind of our dream project. So, but it was all started on Kickstarter with nothing really. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the amazing things about reaching out through something like Kickstarter is because you're not just getting money. You're getting, you're getting connections, you're getting fans. We, we found our DP through our Kickstarter. Building community. Building yeah. community, exactly. It's super powerful. Yeah. And really, you're only limited by your creativity. Um, you know, they came up with ways not to do t-shirts. You may, well, you may go, well, I don't have a... I'm not in the second season of my web series. I don't even have a first season. What do I do? Well, do you know somebody you know, who's a DJ with 10,000 Facebook friends? Do you know? I mean, try to hook up people who have connections to other people and make them part of your project and tap into that. Maybe those 10,000 fans of that person are a model or just somebody who's like doing something different that has a lot of, could be Facebook people, Twitter, anything and use the, make them a part of your project and then tap into their fans and say, oh wow, the person I love is involved in this, so of course I'll spend $10 to prove I love this person who, you know, I mean, just play on the emotion and the connections and the, you know, we're, we're all on this planet together except, you know, otherwise Walt Disney will run everything. Yeah, and find a way, just one more <laughs> thing, Jack, find a way to make your project stand out. Like, is there, is there a really clear niche? Um, like for instance, when we were when we were trying to raise money for the project, um, we well Viviana and I are we keep a vegan diet as did our director on a movie, and we wanted to keep a vegan set, and so we were able to completely raise our catering budget by going out to restaurants Great and saying, idea. "Would you give us a meal? We want to keep a vegan set. This is this is important to us. We want to feed our cast and crew this kind of food," and so. Just finding something there that might give someone an idea. Yeah, I can give you, you know, 15 sandwiches or whatever today, and then somebody else will give you 20 sandwiches tomorrow. And then before we knew it, we didn't have to buy food. And that's a that's a huge niche community, the vegan community. And and then and we were also saying we truly did not harm any animals on set because we didn't eat them. You know. <laughs> so that that was a huge deal. Where do you get uh, vegan grips? <laughs> um, no, that's, that's great. Just pick anything like that. That's, that's, that's a perfect thing because then you're, uh, you know, PETA, something, you know, that, that will address their needs. Like any organization you love, anything you believe in, politically or otherwise, uh, all your anti-bias things. I mean, there's like plenty of organizations that just want to hitch their wagon to something good, not something like everything else that they're not interested in. So uh, that's, that's what creative producing is, is all about. Did we... Actually, crowdfunding is something that we should be spending six months talking about, but... Uh, yeah, I just want to add, it's also a great way, like, for our film, we raised 20000 on... Uh, 10000 on Indiegogo and another ten through New York Foundation for the Arts, because we... Our project... That's a great organization, if you guys don't know about it, and... That's a grant, right? It's a fiscal sponsorship. Okay. NIFA, and it... You know, we started our film in the nonprofit sector, so, you know, we applied for a lot of grants, and through NIFA, we were able to raise tax-deductible uh, donations. And you can do that through Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Um, you lose more money, but your donors get, you know, a tax break. So we raised 20 that way, but once you're tax-deductible, you can't take investments. So we kind of, like, peaked out, and then we changed our status, and then we raised, like, 40 or 50 more through, it, like, small investments. So, like, the ways that you put the movie together are so, like, crazy that crowdfunding, even if you only raise like five or whatever, it's like a way to piece it together with other elements. It, it also makes it more appealing to your for-profit investors because basically if you have like a $100,000 budget and 50 of it doesn't have to be paid back, it means that your, your film is gonna go into profit sooner. It means you have a $100,000 product 
that after fifty thousand dollars goes into profit and goes back to the filmmakers, and uh, it's it's a it's a really good uh, model for a small film. Again, we should reserve six months to go further into this because it's and again, this is an evolving thing. This didn't exist a few years ago. Now. Everybody here has come up with a whole bunch of creative ways to use it very successfully, and, and you all can do the same thing. It's, it's, it's very much within anybody's uh, you know, ability to do it. Uh, what about grants? Has anybody gone into the grant world? That's, that, that's also fraught with you know, we bear We applied, trials. but we, we yeah. kinda, it's, there was like going back to school. To, it's, it's a lot of work so that hard usually doesn't work. To write yeah. papers. Yeah. No, I mean, there's great grants out there. I think now that we're finished with the film, we're actually applying for like CineReach and Jerome Foundation and these grants that always were so flashy for narrative feature films, but they require you to be sort of done with the film, which is kind of annoying because you're like, I don't have the money to make it. How am I going to be done with the film to show you the film to get your fancy grant? So I think we're reapproaching now uh, some of the, the, those grants. But for feature films, there's like a dozen, if that. For documentaries, there's like 10 million, but it sounds like you guys got one or, or did. Oh, no, no. I, oh, we didn't get it. Um, no, I wrote, I think, five, and I'm now on my sixth grant. Application? And application. And you haven't gotten I had one. never done it before. It was something crazy. Um, Are you getting better at it as you keep writing them? I think so. It's hard to say because you never get yeah. feedback. I was actually talking to a scientist friend of mine, and he's like, you don't get any feedback? Like, that's our whole community, what it, it's based on. I was like, yeah, no, no. You can call up. You can call up and ask for a few. I did to the Puffin Foundation. And they, you get, it's like calling the principal's office. They find, they're like, oh, let's see your application here. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you didn't spell that right. And, you know. Actually, the, honestly, the, the Tribeca grants just opened last Thursday, so get on that. Um, they're due by November 5th, if you have something. Um, and that one, you don't have to have it finished. You just have to have an idea, actually. Um, but... The thing, the thing that I learned with grants was to not wait for one. I mean, like, put it out there because I think it'll, A, I think it takes a couple of times applying, I've been told, before, like, anyone notices you're alive, kind of. So, like, your chance gets better each year. But I also, I actually, the people at, at TFI, I remember um, Tamir Mohammed, I think his name is, um, he, he actually said, we want to see a movie being made not a movie approaching us to have permission to be made. So, um, so I think what he meant was exactly what I was doing, like not waiting for them, going on Kickstarter if I had to, you know, that kind Everyone of Everyone loves a moving train, you know, even investors. So it's just the idea, the perception, having a start date, you know, doing whatever you can. Pe uh, people love that, you know. Um, yeah, the, it's the sort of the wrong attitude of going to people and saying, I need you to, to move forward. It's like, I'm moving forward, I hope you'll jump on. I, and that's how a lot of those markets work, by the way. There were these two crazy Israelis, Golan and Globus, who in the 70s made about 400 movies. Every movie they made, this is how they made it. They got a guy to make a poster with Burt Reynolds and Liza Minnelli on it. <laughs> they take the poster to the Cannes Film Festival or some other market, they put it on a stand and say, yes, we have Burt Reynolds and Liza Minnelli starring in this movie. We start shooting in six months, sign here for Belgium, France, and Spain, and for $50,000, you'll have the rights to this movie. They'd get all this paper from all these rights. They'd get, you know, Russia, they'd get uh, Turkey, they'd, they'd get Scotland, they'd get Australia. They'd take this stack of paper, they'd take it to a banker who'd give them like 70 cents on the dollar or, or whatever, and then they'd call up Burt Reynolds and Liza Minnelli and say, Do you want to be in a movie? <laughs> They did it for like 10 years. In fact, if you go back and look at old issues of Variety, when it was like a newspaper, you know, before it got magazine print, if you look at issues from the 80s, uh, I think it was in the 70s and the 80s they did this, pick any issue of any week, go to a library, open up the middle of the Variety, and you will find 20 pages of advertising in there, each one a full poster of Burt Reynolds and Liza Minnelli coming from Canon Films in, you know, 1987, you know, and, and this is, they did this for like, it, over 10 years, it was unbelievable. So, I'm not telling you to do this, but you can try stuff like this, and it works. I mean, a lot of it works. You know, you just, I wouldn't do it with Johnny Depp, I wouldn't do it with Walt Disney, but, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of creative ways. That's what they do a lot of these markets. They say, we have these stars, and we're gonna start shooting in six months, and you want the rights, and they may have nothing, you know, really. Um, so, 
you're only limited by, by your creativity. Um, and the thing about grants, I always wondered if this would work, I, would work. I never did this. Find people in other fields, like somebody who's written a bunch of biology grants or a bunch of engineering grants or a bunch of computer grants and say, hey, you want to work in the movie business? I mean, they're already an expert at writing grants. If they can apply that talent to writing for film grants, make them a producer. And say, if this grant is successful, we'll make you an executive producer. And if this, you know, <laughs> offer them everything. You have everything. Um, make stuff up. I remember, I just want to add, I remember from this, the horrible grant process, the thing that catches, movies cost so much money, and the grants, so many of them are, are smaller, so they say, like, if I give, if you win this and you get $10,000 from us, you're, you're telling me your budget is $250,000, so they want to, you know, the whole thing is they want you to, they want to know that you're going to finish the film, so, like, that's the thing is I think, you know, it's difficult if they don't see that you have any other money. But now I think on a lot of the grant applications, if you say like, hey, I raised 40,000 uh, on you know, crowdfunding and your grant for 25 would allow me to do this, you, you're, you know, your application has a much better chance of being considered as opposed to if you just say, this is a great script that I'm gonna make for $250,000, I want your $15,000 grant. And they're like, is this person ever gonna make this movie? No, so I'll give that grant to somebody that's gonna you know, use all 15,000 and that's their budget. You know, that's what I remember. I don't, I don't know if this applies if, or if it's a different grant, but I also learned from the Tribeca one that it wasn't so much about, because just like you said, it, you can't make a movie on 10,000. Well, you can, but yeah. <laughs> but, but they said it was, it was more about uh, what, you needed to be very specific about what, what you were gonna use those 10,000 for. So you could use those 10,000 to do a, a huge, um, reading for your screenplay, you know, for potential inve investors. But the point of the 10,000, it wasn't really about the 10,000, it was about the connections that that um, institution has to then help you get the other 240 or something, you know. That's right, once you attach, which brings us to sponsorship, once you attach some, and brings us back to what Hollywood does, pre-awareness, pre-soldness, branding, attach in some small way somebody, I mean, I, I saw a picture of a pair of camouflage sneakers in Variety today. And by the way, you should read Variety and The Hollywood Reporter all the time because that's, that's what's going on in the business. And, and I forget what it said, but since I knew we were gonna be talking about this tonight, I realized, go to some, you don't have to go to Nike, go to somebody, small clothing manufacturer, and if you're doing, this gets back to the t-shirts thing a little bit, but you say, I'm gonna put, your sneakers are unknown, I'm gonna put them in a movie, I'm gonna give them away on my huge crowdfunding site, I am going to have the star wear these things. I'm going to, we're going to walk all over Sundance and Toronto and Cannes with these things. Just make me a hundred pair of sneakers, and if you don't want, or make me a thousand pair, whatever, how, however big your cojones are for asking for sneakers, and just, and if they say, well, I don't want to spend the money on the sneakers, say, look, just charge me for this, we're going to give them, for people who give us $100, we'll give them a free pair of sneakers. Instead of charging me the retail price of $100, charge me the $10 it costs you to make them. So it'll cost you nothing to make these sneakers. Now you take this $10,000 worth of sneakers, give them away or wear them or do whatever you do with them, the sneaker manufacturer gets all this free marketing, costs them nothing. Now you're branding with a legitimate business. You're not just somebody in, alone in your apartment by yourself, you have a legitimate business. And if you do this a couple of times, that's why when you look at ads in the trades, you'll get ideas too, because you'll see like an ad for something and there'll be a logo for Kodak. Well, you used to see a logo for Kodak, now you'll see a logo for Canon or something. But next to that Canon logo, you might see a logo for Apple, or you might see, a, and if you can involve these people in some way that either it's good for them to do or it doesn't cost them a lot of money or cost them nothing, and you really can come up with ways that cost nothing, now you're all of a sudden you're this branded project with all these international or national or local companies. I mean, it could be getting back to your, the guy who gave you 15 sandwiches. Start with like, that, he has 10,000 customers. Once he's a part of your movie, now you can glom onto his fan base. So somebody who likes vegan sandwiches, that's a lot of people. And then you might find on, when you Google, that there's an organization of vegan sandwich makers in America and you can tap into that whole thing. So it's just, you know, you're only, you know, you spitball it like you do to make your web series. You're just like, what makes us laugh? It's, it's, it's kind of the same process. Um, we're not gonna get to everything tonight, I just realized, but 
I, the reason I'm staying on this topic so long is because I got some cards from you who wrote questions, and I went through them very quickly, and I would say more than three quarters of them were about creative funding ideas. So since we don't have a lot of time, I think we should just stay a little bit more on this one, and, and then we'll summarize after this. And again, it can be like you said, it just, um, it doesn't even have to be CDs or DVDs that you have to make and put a stamp on. It can be something that you can just, you know, stream or email or, you know, some way that, that, that doesn't cost anything. And you said something very interesting, which goes back to the whole idea of combining resources. If you have an investor who says no, you don't take no for an answer unless they say no, and if I see you again, I will shoot you in the face. And you know they have a gun and you know they've been in jail for murder. Otherwise, you go back and you, you, you hit them again. And then after a while, when they're like worn down, you say, well, wait a minute. I know I need $100,000. You know I need $100,000. I'm only asking you for $10,000. What if I raise $90,000? Will you give me the last $10,000? And they'll say, all right, you raise $90,000, you pain in my ass, I'll give you $10,000. <laughs> then you hold them to it. Then you go back and get the grant for $20,000. Then you do the crowdfunding for $20,000. Then you get the tax rebate for 30%. All of a sudden, that guy just saying yes, you go backwards and raise your entire budget. And um, have you done this kind of thing? Or, you know, I, I mean, I know people have done this. Or you'll do it next time. Definitely okay. done it, yeah. I mean, Amy, what's the term? There's soft money and what's the, what's the real money mean? What's real money called? Cash. But I was like, <laughs> cash money. But it occurred to me in this process that, that I guess the studios work like this a lot too, that a lot of movies are made with ether. You know, yeah. it's like yeah. you have just enough to get production done, which is like half the actual budget. Um, and you're like, oh, wow, so I only have this much in the bank. I can actually kind of go start the movie and then the rest is like Barnum and Bailey like you're you know like some guy gives you money here you hand it there he gives you paper there you hand it there and then somehow you finish the movie yeah. it's 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 fun but grueling <laughs> you just figure it out yeah like you're saying but, but if you make it fun it's persistence right. it's just real uh Ballsy persistence. Right. You just have to keep, and, and you're right. Uh, someone says no, it's not necessarily no. Uh, there's a lot, you come back at a different way or a different, like, maybe if you don't want to do this, maybe you, you'll do a tax deductible donation. How about if you do a tax deductible donation through our uh, fiscal sponsorship? You know, you got to find what, what is the in and loop back to people. And I think this is why it's so important to have at least one other producer with you because, you know, I mean, all of you, I think actors are really, and writers, I mean, the amount of rejection that you get, the amount of failure it's, that you have. It's, br it's brutal, and I, I, I have a great producing partner, and uh, Ann Hubble, and in my company, Tangerine Entertainment, and, you know, we go to L.A. to pitch, we, you know, go to markets, we're, we're you know, selling our wares, uh, trying to raise money, and, and it's so great there's two, because one of us might just lose steam in a I meeting droop. and the other one yeah. sees it and picks up or uh, you know we're in LA and we're just, oh, I just can't oh, I just can't go to that meeting like come on we're gonna do it you know it's 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 just it's moral support and we also have a great rapport we we can finish each other's sentences we we can deduce what's going on and someone can go in for the kill someone's we 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 script out before we go into like a pitch meeting we really basically script out like if he if the person says this then we're going to do this okay you're going to be like you know quiet and not say anything and they'll be scared of you and i'm going to be like super friendly you know we really we really figure that stuff out good it's guy like, bad guy you guys are actors it's actors. easier for you i'm like Acting. you know I'm def I'm not an actor at all, and uh, but we really think about it in, in those terms, you know. Um, but it is it's it's so great to have a producing partner who you trust and have a good relationship with, and and have the same uh, ability to, you know, go through that process with. And I think it gives you a credibility too, because if you go in there and it's like, yeah, this guy came in and like tried to get my money, and I don't know if I can trust him. But if the guy has a beautiful wife. Well, I can't trust that guy, but boy, she's really, maybe I could trust her, you know, like, or she could take the, don't trust him, I'd let you listen to me. You know, I mean, there's way, again, your actors, act, you know? I mean, it, it, you, it's, it, it's true. You have to act and you have to script and research who you're meeting with. Really go right. out, find Google. out what they like, <laughs> what they're interested in, what they're interested, what they like, what they do. You can find out all that information online and uh, see what el who else they've worked with. And in my case, I always go and see. Usually, there's other people I know who've worked with them. I might call that other person and say, like, look, I have a meeting with so and so. What do you, you know, what do you 
think, what are they, oh, you played tennis with them? Oh, they play tennis. You know, the beginning of a meeting, uh, you know, if someone has a picture of their dog on their desk, I'll say like, oh, hey, you know, uh, what's your dog's name? <laughs> you know, like really find a way to engage with them personally. I mean, don't spend a whole half hour talking about the dog, but you know, like find a way in to get them relaxed, get someone relaxed, get, get engaged, find a point of connection uh, going in. Don't just go and say like, okay, like attack them with their pitch. And in, in reverse, when people come in and start attacking me with a pitch, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's best just to be relaxed, uh, have a plan, have a conversation. Usually I'd say if you have a 30 minute meeting with someone, the first five minutes, some sort of chit chat, you know, then you kind of find a point of entry or there's usually like a little bit of a lull. You say, okay, well, here's what we're talking about today. Um, I mean, there could be a whole six months on the art of pitching, but um, yeah, there's a whole uh, art to that. And, and you know, you mentioned something, tennis. Well, I don't play tennis, but if the guy I was trying to get money from played tennis, I would get a great tennis player to be a co-producer on this project, and I'd bring that <laughs> co-producer tennis player in with a can of tennis balls. These were just invented. Nobody has these tennis balls. Uh -huh. You know, I, I just got them from the guy who won Wimbledon last week. Here, it's but a gift. Be, but be casual about it, and that, but it's that a $3 makes it seem gift. Cool. Yeah, that makes, it makes right. it seem cooler. Yeah, you know, just like have them say like, "Oh, you play tennis? Oh my God, look yeah. what I happen to have in my bag." Right. You, know? <laughs> you don't want to be like oh, overly kissing ass. You're just like, "Oh my God!" Like make a and make a joke out of it. You know, I mean, what's great about my producing partner too is we have we're very similar in a lot of ways, but we also have very different backgrounds and skills. So she has a background in you know, uh, working for not-for-profits, uh, working in a corporate environment, which I have none of that. Uh, I've worked on a lot of films with a lot of people. Um, uh, she's great with, she's got like a Rolodex uh, of actors. Like if you play Trivial Pursuit with her, you're dead. Um, so she can like, cause sometimes we say like, oh, on that TV show, and I'm just like, and she like jumps in uh, anything with like numbers or, you know, a certain era of filmmaking or direct, I've met a lot of directors, work with a lot of different directors. You know, so we have a, a complementary knowledge base, which is super helpful in a meeting, like if one person needs to jump in. Um, yeah, choose your producing partners carefully. And you know, that goes with companies too. I mean, it took me a lot, I lived in LA for eight years and I used to go into these companies. I'd pitch something and they're looking at me like, get out. And I'm like, why are they looking at me this way? This is a really good idea. I've had. Bunch of people tell me this is a good idea. The last company almost bought it, as a matter of fact. Well, the company that I was pitching to was only buying half-hour comedies for people under 25 that week. I didn't know that. I should not have been in that room. I should have known that and not been in that room. Find out what people are buying. Find out, you know, what they're interested in. You might find, you know, I mean, just like, you know, uh, YouTube will take, like, anything. And if it's a this, that, and the other thing, they might do something special. Or they might, you know, there's all these, like, Pick up on these things. Here's like the th a per perfect example. I have our new company, Tangerine Entertainment, uh, is only to produce uh, and build community for films directed by women. We have a specific agenda. Perfect. perfect. If you're a guy, if you're a dude director, don't send us your project. <laughs> I'm just like dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> like out. <laughs> you know, really? <laughs> I don't even return the email, you know. And just all you have to do is click Tangerine Entertainment, and you can. It's on the cover of our thing. Exactly what our mission is, you know. Do your research uh, and look look smart and find a way in, you know. Or compliment like you came up. You you saw that our review in Variety was posted uh, a couple hours ago. That's smart. You you you're not even pitching anything to me that I know of. But you were you said like right. I saw your nice review from Toronto. <laughs> And uh, and I felt like oh it made me feel good and it made you look smart and it's it's part of being in the industry is is uh, being smart and doing the research and reading the trades and uh, complimenting someone and going about it that way. I mean and, and this goes with everything you do not just producing. Yeah, yeah. I, Monday night I had the honor of uh, interviewing um, Josh Brolin and Kate Winslet. It was like a huge thrill for a half an hour in front of 500 people at SVA, thanks to the Screen Actors Guild Foundation and Stacy. Well, I happen to luckily be able to spend one minute with Josh, and he's a very open, friendly guy, and I heard him say something about Breaking Bad. 
So I said, oh, you're a friend of, friend of, you're a fan of Breaking Bad? He said, am I a fan? And well, we just bonded instantly because we're both big fans. Then in the beginning of the discussion in front of 500 people, I, he, I happened to know or guess that he loves No Country for Old Men because he happened to have made that movie and it's one of the best movies ever made. And I'm a huge fan of that. I tied Breaking Bad to No Country for Old Men and we had just met minutes ago and he leaps up, throws his arm around me, starts hugging me. So all you gotta, and now I wasn't trying to get a hug from him, but it, it was, <laughs> I would have preferred Kate Winslet threw her arms around me and hugged me, but I, you know, I'll take what I can get. Uh, the point is, you can find something like about everybody. Like I just said that to her because it's, be, it's like natural. I just saw it this afternoon. I see producer Amy Hobby, my eyeballs jumped out of my head. I'm gonna see her tonight, isn't that strange, you know? So you can tie all this stuff together and, and you, really, you really have to do it, otherwise you're just a stranger. You know, that's how, like, you bonded with all these people because you have something in common. Same with you on your, your project. And it's really, think about this stuff and you will, people will flock to you. Well, and also with investors, um, you know, you have to build trust. So p part of that is like, oh, you know so-and-so, or you worked with that person, or, you know, it's just, it's building uh, a sense of trust. And you, really, the goal most of the time is to get a second meeting, you know, is to have them like you, feel like you might have something in common, and to get a second meeting. I mean, and that's good to talk about with, my producing partner and I talk about that all the time. We're like, okay, what's the goal of this meeting? You know, and a lot of times it's to get a second meeting. Sometimes we go in saying, okay, we got, we got to get them to cash flow. So how, how can we do that? Do you want to be the bad cop and go in and say this? And I'll, you know, you, you got to think about what the goal of the meeting is. Yeah, there's a three, three taps thing, right? Like right. in the nonprofit world, I think it applies a lot to both like trying to find an investor and nonprofit is, you know, you have to have these three successful meetings before somebody commits. So, you know, in the first one, you just like, full on, and then when they say no, you're like, oh, but like you have to sort of look at it as like building that trust and trying to, you know, tap their shoulder three times and they turn around and the fourth, you're like, so, no, are you gonna give me the money? Here's the routing number. <laughs> well, I must say these two hours just like shot right by. I think we got to about, half of what I hoped we would get to. But this is such an important, I'm, I'm glad we stayed with this because I know many of you, you have a project, you're ready to go, and you're like, where do I get the money? You know, like, that really is the biggest problem you have in life now. Um, that's everybody's biggest problem, I guess. Where do I get the money? Uh, how do I pay the bills? How do I pay the rent? Um, and um, I, I think, you know, use this. And make friends with all these people here. Just turn to the person next to you, shake their hand, and say, you know, what's your name? Give me your card. If you have a project, let's just you know talk about it, and just do that as you go through life, and you will uh, attach the elements. You know they talk about attaching elements. It's really getting humans to work together and connect. Um, but uh, I, I hope we got started anyway on your way to a, a master's degree in producing. And uh, but before you go, please thank our wonderful, wonderful guests: Viviana Stewart, Grace, Kate, Andrew, Amy. Thank you.